Welcome to Tech London, a show featuring interviews with London's top creative entrepreneurs, startups, investors, design agencies, internet marketers, and freelancers that make up the Tech London online community, which mostly lives on the Slack instant messaging platform. We rotate through both hosts and guests for these interviews, so you have the chance to hear from multiple perspectives on London's tech scene. Hello, folks, and welcome back to another long overdue Tech London podcast. I've been uh, moving country, assembling a list and organizing tons of things, and suddenly five weeks have gone past without a production, which is horrific. But I've got my friend Sarah back in the studio, um, back in the studio because we had another podcast together, and she is an author, a copywriter, and does loads of stuff online. And I pulled her in here today to just go through what I think is a really important chat about how we put words on our website because we write so much every day in tweets and on Instagram and in WhatsApp messages and Slack channels. And being very good at language is super important. And it's something I find really, really hard. And I'm writing lots and always trying to work out which word is which. And Sarah has written a written, published, is about to publish a book. Written. Written. Yeah, I don't know why why I stalled on that um, to help us with that. So, so Sarah, what overall in the, in the, uh, universe what are you known for and what would you like to be known for it's a big question so i'm known yes. for being a copywriter i'm known for being the queen of the confusables and yeah what else am i known for god knows you guys are probably better off telling me than that than uh, than me guessing um i think i'm kind of known for what i would like to be known for really like i've been sharing these commonly confused words and ways to remember them kind of handy sticky memorable tips to remember commonly confused words since like t- 2016 i think back on um back on twitter and now i've written a book that comp- that compiles them all together in one place and it's going to be a a book that william morris would approve of it's going to be beautiful and useful and uh yeah, it's it's yeah. It's, it's the most significant book in this category since Eat Shoots and Leaves. Do you remember that one? <laughs> Quite possibly, yeah. That's a great book. That is a great book. There's I, I love playing with that. Um so one one of the things before we get into this even more is uh we're keen to say that this is not about um your teacher making sure you're good at your your English homework. It, oh god no. Do you want to explain a bit about that? Because that's I, I struggle with this too. So it's not about getting it right or wrong. It's about putting the effort in to connect. Yeah, I think making sure that you actually think about the words you use is really important. Um, I'm certainly not here to be like a strict teacher. I don't take that opinion that standards of English use of falling and it's despicable and, you know, I don't know, the government's to blame or God knows what. I, that, that's just not me at all. I just, I know that over nearly 30 years as a copywriter and editor and 23 years as a freelancer, I have worked with so many smart people for whom language use is not intuitive. They're super smart people and they still occasionally confuse the wrong spelling of practice or they use effect when they mean effect or they use oh I don't know imply when they mean infer um poisonous when they mean venomous mean venomous it's it's just the kinds of things that I might find easy I mean not gonna lie I still have to look this stuff up from time to time every editor copywriter proofreader everybody who writes has to look stuff up what I wanted to provide was a book that is so gorgeous to use that it just typographically it's glorious i'm allowed to say that right <laughs> i'm it's, invested it's, i'm backing it <laughs> we're, we're on video here folks and it's like she's about to hold it up to the camera the <laughs> podcast, but I, I understand your urgency with that yeah it's it, i just think it, it, if something is easy and delightful to use it's going to get used more likely than something that just sort of st- sits in a dusty bookshelf this is a book to keep on your desk and it's a book that you'll want to kind of flick through and check that you're using the right words so that you get your meaning across in the right way and that your message means what you want it to say so there's a, there's a whole thing here about boosting your vocabulary one of my things in is um yeah i so so i 
most of my most of my time is spent looking at co-working space websites, and they all have they will say things like community, collaborate, connection. It's like what what does that actually mean? And then if mm. I'm looking for if I'm looking for anything from like you know a, a drinks bottle to a an app or something like that, if I go to every website and they all say the same thing, the one the one I am, um, and then we'll back down from jargon bashing, but the one I see on every nearly every tech website is london's leading it support company yeah <laughs> they can't all be like right <laughs> they can't all be um and london's leading software provider or london's leading investment strategy firm or something like that mm. and it, it must occur to us because a lot of people listening to this in the tech london community are are try, like um are trying to sell something robert louis stevenson mm. said everybody sells something for the leap a living and if someone's mm. coming to our websites and they see the same thing all the time, it, mm. it kind of, you know, you, you, you go go immune. And yeah. when you boost your vocabulary, and this is the little bit I want to get into here, it's a, it, it just makes you stand out just by changing your language. Yeah, it's a, it, it's to do with um, it's to do with communicating personality as well. I think I'm I'm all about avoiding b2b and b2c and being more h to h and i can say that i didn't come up with that but i just think at the end of the day whoever your audience is um that person is a human being you're a human being and whether you see yourself as a freelancer an entrepreneur a business owner the director of a business whatever it is, you've got to write and you've got to stand out in your communications in a way that makes you sound as if you've got a personality. And too many businesses don't do that. They revert to that, um, to the, to the generic language. Do you know what? I just caught myself out on it. Yeah. Great word. (laughs) Homogenous. I'm so excited about a new word. I can't can't pronounce it. (laughs) Yeah, it's it, it's not necessarily about using um, more complicated words. In fact, if anything, it's probably the opposite. It's about talking um, to your customers in a language that they really relate to, using their language and identifying the fact that you understand their concerns and the problems that they face and the things that keep them up at night. And you've got the solution to solve those problems and really to make their life easier. That's what we all want to do. But but too many people, we use that generic, blah, filler sort of language and, and don't really think about the words we use. So, yeah, my I've got three main goals for the book. I think these are the three kind of selling points. The idea is that it'll help people boost their vocabulary, write with confidence and avoid embarrassing mistakes. And those are things that genuinely everybody could do with. So, um, yeah, I mean, somebody, the, the the guy who is the director of Pro Copywriters, which is the um, professional body for copywriters, said, um, incredibly useful for anyone who reads, writes or speaks. So <laughs> that's all of us then, right? Wow. Yeah, I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happy with that, but I wonder because I'm not. I'm like really keen on language. A lot of that is because um, when when I was let me get my violin out. When I was younger, I didn't discover I was dyslexic until I went to university and my English. I did English literature and education, and my English teacher said, "Bernie, you're like really enthusiastic about you know taking part in lessons and everything, but at some point you will have to hand in some work. And if you were sleeping at the back of the class." I would think you were just not interested, but you're so interested. I think you should go and see the lady in um, Roslyn in the Roehampton Educational Development Centre and have a test. And I was like off the charts dyslexic, which was which was actually wow. really nice to find out. And then when I found out my issue was only that I'm dyslexic, I just got tried to get really really good at writing, and you know I felt this kind of like inability to write stuff because you know it was very hard for me to do so. And and I often wonder if, you know, I often think that everyone should be as enthusiastic about writing and words and finding out how to construct sentences as I have, <laughs> because I'm kind of like catching up. But it is um, it is a really, really important skill. And how you, how you craft stuff and put it on your website might sound really, you know, oh God, that's a lot of effort. But when people come to your website, the more 
uh, the, the harder it is to read, mm. the quicker they'll flick away. Mm -hmm. And so the effort, the small amount of effort, or maybe it is a big amount of effort, if you were like me, to put stuff on your website that's clear, will will save you, I don't know, probably save you millions in trying to like game SEO engines because people will stick around and be able to read it. If they have to read something mm. that's either incredibly boring or very, very difficult to read because you're using either it's badly written or you use very obsequious language. Um, <laughs> don't know what that is. Don't, don't press me on that. I just shout out <laughs> a long word. Um, you know, esoteric. It, it will lose esoteric language. Yeah, it, it will lose people. Now, um, but... How's, so my question at the end of all that is like, how, how can we just write simply? Is, is there a like, how do you, when you're working with people, how do you say like, hey, just chill it, chill down the Theosaurus and say, yeah. say what you want to say? Yeah, I do. I, I do a, I do a webinar about that actually, a training webinar, um, because it is something that everybody, not every business owner, can afford to write to to work with a copywriter. We all understand that. Like some will, but some will use a copywriter for their website copy, for example. But then we are still writing these things, like you mentioned, social media posts, LinkedIn posts, tweets, Slack. Um, conversations, WhatsApps, we all still have to write for our business day to day. If maths isn't your strong point, if maths is a thing you don't find intuitive, like for me, I have an accountant who does all my figures. I don't really need to worry about them. I just need to be aware of what they are. But I can't avoid writing for my business. I don't want to avoid writing. Obviously, that's my superpower. That's what I do for a living. But a lot of people don't, you know, smart people, these smart people that I've worked with over the years, they are incredibly clever people, but they don't find language intuitive. So I think when you don't find it intuitive, that's when you resort to those kind of throwaway phrases that you hear and you don't really question what they mean. Like we would like to apologize for any inconvenience caused. It's just like you those phrases get thrown out without really actually thinking about, is there a better way to say this? Because people yes. just find themselves in a particular position and think, okay, so X has happened and this is the wording I use to describe this thing. So how do you stand out if you're using the same words as everybody else? Why not just say, we messed up, we're sorry. Or I there's, messed there's up, some... I'm sorry. Even more powerful. Do, do you know um, what... what... Best example of that, or a favourite example of that, is um, do, do you know a book called Without Bullshit by Josh someone? No. It was, it, so in his um, so I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes, folks. It's um, a guy called Josh who used to work for Forrester Research, and he's just very good at writing. He's very, uh, he's could, the name of his book shows you his personality writing without bullshit. Um, but his uh, you know, he's, he's just done loads of research and report and he loves language and he's one of the few people that actually does blog every day and he picks up words and stuff like this and he has two examples in his book is one was um jack dorsey had to fire a lot of people from twitter and his first line of his thing is these emails are always it's something like these emails are always dry and boring and full of corporate bollocks so here we go is um this is this we're going to have to cut people back we promise you we'll do this we'll help you find a job and then Below is all the gobbledygook that, you need, that we need to share with you. And it was very quick. The other guy is from Nokia, which was when it was taken over by Microsoft. Mm. And he wrote a three-page email to, to everyone in the company. And on the, I think it's like halfway through the second page, at the end of the, like, one of the last paragraphs, it was said, and that is why we're going to have to let 100 people go. So he really buried wow. the lead. And when you listen to it, it, it it's not funny to read because it's about letting a load of people be fired but it's hilarious the amount of it's, it's like he was pacing up and down the room trying to avoid delivering the bad news and mm -hmm. i think jack dorsey's whatever you might think of jack dorsey but you know jack dorsey is like right to the you know here's mm -hmm. what we've got to do mm -hmm. here's here's the pain we're gonna to have to you know go through together is, is, is a much braver way of doing it and mm -hmm. the other thing like comment on this is i i feel i've always felt that people as soon as they you know, they might be at home doing surfing, cooking interesting things, watching Quentin Tarantino films and be really funny with their children. And then when they come to work, they turn into this kind of like droidy, you know, I'm, I've suddenly turned into business. So, and even 
you know, the H two H thing, even though we are all human beings, it's all about relationships, and that is a huge. Mm-hmm. That's the most exciting part of growing businesses and communities and everything together. But mm-hmm. pe- it's less and less. But people seem to confuse being professional with being businessy. Oh God, yeah, being dull, being boring, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's it, yeah, it's a it's a real it's a pet hate of mine, but it's something that I kind of combat day to day in my work as a copywriter. Um, it's it's certainly something that is it's everywhere. And the thing is, if you want to stand out and you want to get noticed, because wh- where I thought you were going with that little anecdote with people might be out, they might be surfing, they might be watching Quentin Tarantino movies, and I thought you were going to say, um, and our job is to get their attention. Because can, it is. Can, it so is, when, you know, yeah. uh, they, they, those people who are surfing and watching Quentin Tarantino movies may be our clients and we have to get their attention. We have to cut through swathes and swathes of rubbish, dull, dry, boring, uninspiring, uninteresting, all the synonyms for boring. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but literally that, that is our job. So if we can stand out by being really clear and getting to the point and using the right words and using them well, then we have a competitive advantage. I think, I, I, not even I think, see, that's, that's a weasel word that is, is I think what, what I deeply believe is when you use like clear, clear language, it connects much, much faster. Yeah. And, and people, like, there's something you said earlier, when, when people say, um, you know, about, Ah, oh, something about saying sorry because we apologise for any yeah. inconvenience caused. Yeah, we go yeah. into like immune systems. Yeah, where, like, we we just sort of are oh, here that I expect them to say that you know. Um, around it doesn't COVID mean time. anything, does it? It stops. No, no. It, it, it it's it loses its meaning because it's so commonly used. It's just like you hear the words, but the meaning doesn't connect with your heart. Whereas it, whereas if a company actually says, "We messed up. We're really sorry." then that stands out because, oh my gosh, you know, somebody's actually taken ownership. Somebody actually wants to connect with me and really appreciates the, you know, really appreciates the inconvenience that that error has caused or how that's made my day a bit more shit, you know? It's- we, we, we can, I think, I think apologizing in a humane way is a much better shock tactic than an actual shock tactic of, you know, mm. I can't think of any shock tactics off the, head, off the top of my head. Um, like when when we when we moved to Spain, our um our bless them, our removal company like really really screwed up, and the the uh, the person in the office emailed back and said we can only apologise. And because I'm all, my he- my head is totally in this conversation all the time that we're having now. Like every time I'm walking mm-hmm. down a road, I'm going I'm, I'm assessing, and judging what people have written in their shop yeah. windows and what yeah. signs say and what spot on it. I can't switch off. Um, we can only apologize and my first reaction was like you know what do you mean you can like you can only apologize like you can only like is, did you copy and paste that or mm-hmm. and and i knew because we had been talking on the phone that she was really sorry about the way it had all gone down but if it, was, it felt like a sort of standard issue letter you know probably was kind of thing mm-hmm. um and the um there's another little bit in there as well is about um can you say a bit more about the human to human thing? Because that is that's the thing I'd like people to leave with is stop being businessy and start being human. And yeah, I uh, th- there's two things that I wanted to that I wanted to come back to. What is the first? Oh yeah, so you were talking about when you use really clear language and you use the right words, you've got a better chance of getting your message from the page or the screen, depending on where your customers are reading, from the page to the brain with the least resistance. So that's what we're up against. We're up against distractions 24-7. We're up against double screening. We're up against someone's trying to read something, someone you want them to take action, and you're trying to get them to read your email, and they're trying to do something else at the same time. If you use clear language and you use human language that connects with them, you've got a far better chance of actually making an impact, standing out and getting them to take action. So it's that, that's how important it is. There's a quote from Nelson Mandela that I quite often use. And obviously, um, like 
let's just say it's non-gender specific because of when when he said it but um when you talk to a man in a language he understands that goes to his head but when you talk to a man using his language that goes to his heart and yep. if you want to influence somebody to act to make a decision to buy your product to hire your services or to book your event whatever it is you need to make a connection and prove that you understand the problems that they're facing the pains that they go through as a daily you know on a daily basis and if you get that sweet spot you use that human language you use the right words use the right spelling of the right words then you've got a far more far stronger chance of connecting with that person's heart i and it's the it's the amount of energy they have to use to, to decode what you're what you're saying as well. Because yeah, I will yeah. I will just if you do we switch off. If, yeah. What was the other thing? That was the other was, thing. The first was thing the was the was the was about getting to <laughs> getting the message from the page to the brain with the least resistance, and that and the the Mandela quote was the second thing. So we, we have a we have a I'm going to say a few minutes, but that that creates unnecessary urgency to what I'm about to ask you is. So everyone in the Tech London community has at some stage started something, whether it's a cup of tea or a multi million pound company. Um, what is the where, where where did this book start for you? Where, where was the kind of genesis of the little book and confusables? It's funny because I sort of tell the story in the conclusion of the book which is a bit of a, a roundabout way to do it. But I've been sharing these sort of sticky, memorable spelling tips and usage tips on social media since 2016. I think I said that. And I've been collecting them in this big list because I'm I'm just a nerd, basically. I'm just a massive nerd. And language fascinates me. I find it just so interesting and I have also a very obsessive brain so I've been collecting these things for a long time and I knew that this problem wasn't going away these smart people out there were still misusing the 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 words that I consider to be quite simple to use but at the same time I realized that not everybody does find them simple to use and I wanted to kind of tap into that fact that we learn best when we're having fun. I wanted to create something that was fun, enjoyable, easy to use, um intuitive, informative, entertaining, witty, you name it. And um I actually had the idea for the book back in 2016 and I went to talk to somebody in a cafe in Cheltenham who had already self-published a number of novels and she told me everything she knew about the self-publishing process and she just totally terrified me I was just like absolutely no way am I going through all that so I just wasn't ready and the book wasn't ready and I kind of just abandoned the idea but obviously it was mulling away in the back of my brain and then 2020 I self-published survival skills for freelancers and that has since helped small business owners and entrepreneurs in 22 countries, as I said at the start, um, to kind of grow in confidence and find their own freelance success. And um, after that, I kept feeling this pressure. Oh my God, I should be publishing a second book. I should be doing. And at the start of this year, ironically, I did this workshop and it's, it was all about goal setting. I can't set goals for Toffee. I just, I, they become obsessions. So I try not to set goals as much as possible. But um, the the woman said, oh, is there anything, have a think about whether there's anything that you want to let go of this year. What do you not want to do? What's not serving you? What are you feeling you should do, but you really don't want to do? And I wrote on this piece of paper, capital letters, loads of exclamation marks. I do not have to write a second book. and Two weeks later, I'd started the little book of confusables. So it was just letting go of that feeling of I should do it that freed up that headspace for me to realize this was what I really wanted to do because I have this knowledge and through sharing this knowledge in this format that I think people are going to absolutely love, I've um, got the ability to make the world maybe marginally better in some way. Definitely better. You, you've got, a, you know, no, no maybes about it. Is <laughs> having a having a uh, you know a fun book on your desk to hand is you know when like over, over here I have my um ah, 
No, I can't get it. I've got my got my 12 week year field guide and it's just always hanging around my desk because I because I just it, I mean it's not nearly as beautiful as um as your one. So Brian, if you if you're listening, I'm sorry. But <laughs> it, it like having something to pick up and thumb through it gives it, it kind of gives you a jolt or a, you know a bit of input throughout the day because otherwise I know having stuff around is really important for inspiration. Um, mm. Can you say a little bit about the uh, freelancers book? Because there's a lot of people in the tech community that what, maybe they identify as uh, entrepreneurs, but secretly they're freelancers. And and there's a lot of people starting something, trying to work out how to get their company going and mm. have a little side gig to survive. So pitch Pitch that for one of the better terms. Pitch that. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it is. I know we don't um, pitch, but it's, I'd like it's well worth the well worth the effort of reading it. Yeah, it condenses twenty years of real life experience plus um, quotes from over a hundred freelancers in different fields um, to bust the eight myths of self employment and to explain why. Um, well, really, why you need to charge more, um, how to develop the confidence to charge more, how to go outside your comfort zone, avoiding negative self-talk, um, why community and connection is so vital. Um, so many myths about self-employment that it busts. And as I say, it's helped people in over 22 countries to grow in confidence. And I mean, I get people messaging me every week saying, oh my God, your book's given me the confidence to double my rates or to increase my prices. And I've never been so comfortable as a freelancer. I'm happy saying no now. I turn down the work that I really don't want. I don't ever deal with the difficult customers anymore. So um, yeah, what else can I say about it? It was a bestseller. It's been featured in Forbes. Um, yeah. And you've been on 17 million podcasts talking about it. <laughs> 60 it, it is podcasts. A, yeah, quite a lot. That, that was... Um, because when when I started freelancing, uh, I, I was a freelance event manager for like. If I wanted to like really play it, I'd say I've been a freelancer for twenty years. But I was a, I was a freelance event manager for a long time, and then I became about two thousand eight. I started doing marketing and communications. But um, it just seemed at the end of uh, I think it must be after the two thousand eight crash, it became okay to be a freelancer because for a long time freelancer was secret code for no one will hire me. And then in the in the last ten years, it's been much more acceptable to go. I am a freelancer and and stuff yeah, like I that. Never and felt that stigma. It's weird. Uh, I, 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 I I think I, because yeah. I like the, I, I use this quote in the book that if that I really early on realized that if I wanted half decent clients with half decent budgets, I needed more than a half assed approach. And I think there are very much two different camps of freelancers: people who freelance through choice because they want the lifestyle, the flexibility um, and the freedom, which isn't all it's cracked up to, isn't always all it's cracked up to be. And that's, that's where these, the challenges that the book provides the kind of coping strategies for and the way to, um, to sail through those challenges. That's the stuff that we're not anticipating. We don't realize that there's so much kind of back end messiness and, and, and difficulty and, being prepared by reading that book is the way to to deal with it. Second plug, sorry. Um, completely forgotten where I was going with that. It was about, yeah, it was no, about the, the stigma. Um, I, didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't never feel a stigma. But yeah, and then there is the other side, which is where people set up as a freelancer because they've been fired and they can't get another job. And those people who haven't actively taken that decision, they perhaps have extra challenges that the rest of us don't have but um yeah i don't i don't see there being a stigma now there's, and there's not anymore there's not anymore no but, there, but even even like I, I think i only thought of this as you were saying that is i wish i'd just like done everything in that like i could do everything in that book nowadays and not everything i mean don't don't, don't ask me to quote but um i wish i'd acted like that it was well within my power to act like that in like 2010, but it took me like eight years to get the yeah. the sense of self worth and you know oh, yeah, definitely. All, all that you know imposter syndrome conversation and stuff like that. So relatable. It's, hey, did you know like 86 percent of um, UK professionals admit to suffering from imposter syndrome? So if anybody out there listening is feeling like a fraud, like they're not good enough, like they're going to be found out just take comfort from the fact that you are not alone 
Yeah. There's um there's a whole, I can feel I can feel the imposter syndrome conversation coming now. But um, go, how long is it? Like three hours on Audible? It's really short that book. It is really short on no. Audible. I think it's like four hours maybe in total. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Four. so it's on Audible, hardback, paperback, and Kindle. And yep. the little book of Confusables is on paperback and Kindle. Will it, will it ever work on Audible, or is it? Yeah, I'm talking to the studio guy today, actually. I messaged I, I would him love today. You to do it on yeah, yeah. I don't quite know how it will work on Audible, but I think there is a demand for it. I've been amazed, but- actually, by how many people have bought survival skills on audible and i think it's a completely different audience i don't think people decide between paperback and audible they're either somebody who likes a paperback or somebody who listens to audiobooks I, 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 there's a lot of things where i have both books oh, okay um, a lot because... of people got the audible book or the kindle book and then bought the paperback because they were like oh i want to own this and highlight it and turn pages over that's yeah interesting. That, that... That, that, that's where we get it. I would um, so this, so this the Confusables book. I'd listen to it on Audible because I'd take in information like that, and I'd be like, "Oh, I never realised that." You know, that's had a great effect on me, okay. and all that kind of thing. Yeah, and then exactly. I'd have it as a reference copy on my desk, and and that's what I do. And yeah. someone else, there's there's Neil Usher who um, writes just over here. Uh, my my friend Neil Usher writes Elemental Change, making stuff happen when nothing stands still. And I wish he'd have that on Audible. He, he's actually, I've actually made it, he's written, this is his, he's, he's bringing out his third book, which is Unfucked Work. And he, I finally got him to start recording chapters and he sent the, he sent the Audible version to me that he's just, you know, done on his computer because he want, he knows I'm not going to read the first copy. Mm-hmm. So he, he's recorded it especially for me. Which oh, amazing. Very special. Oh, but wow. The, the way he's so well read and so funny um not not deliberately funny like just says things in a very funny he's like do you know mark thomas the comedian yeah he, he has that kind of thing going on about work um it is it it, it reads it he reads it really really well but let's um let's hit it and quit and where can we we're going to put links in the show notes to um websites and everything like that but send yeah. them out for those people that are wandering around listening and so you can, shout find... Or can find you the Little Book of Confusables and Survival Skills for Freelancers on Amazon. Um, and you can go to confusables.co.uk if you want a... To be honest, once it's out on Amazon, I can't really see the point of going to the landing page. You might as well just go and read the reviews on Amazon. But um, yeah, you can, go, you can go to confusables.co.uk. You can find me online, connect with me and sign up to my newsletter. I won't share the link for that because that's really faffy. Um, but Bernie, I'm sure you'll include the link in the show notes. I, I will. I will. Where's, where's the best place to stalk you online socially? Um, I am most active on LinkedIn and Instagram. I'm the copywriter's day on Instagram and Sarah Townsend editorial on LinkedIn. The, the first one sounded like cop this and the LinkedIn one sounded very grown, grown up. You know, <laughs> <copywriter's name. laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't well, really know why I bother with Instagram at the moment. Honestly, it's just, it, it's so quiet over the summer. And honestly, also, who decides to launch a book in August? Like who we in do. their right mind does that? So I, I feel like I've given myself kind of an extra hurdle, although um, there's, a, there's, there's already a pretty good buzz on social. So I'm feeling super confident for Thursday. It, it's going to be right. when I when I sort out my um because because now we've now we've moved to Spain um we are on Amazon so the Amazon Spain store so I just got to work out how to uh, how to I sound, that makes it sound much harder than it is trying to work out <laughs> changing Amazon changing Amazon stores is almost an and app stores on Apple is almost as traumatic as actually moving house <laughs> I will oh, I will God. save my I will, I will save my after after podcast patter when you stop recording. Thanks very much for your time and attention and listening to the Tech London podcast today. Be sure to go to the Tech London Slack channel and connect with thousands of other people that are part of the creative economy, the startup ecosystem in London. And that channel has been going since 2014 when John, Jonathan started it, when Slack arrived. And I remember him saying to me, I'm going to start a Slack channel and call it Tech London. And I went, see how that goes. And now it's thousands of people that have been connecting for years and years. Thank you very much for your time and attention and be careful out there. It is a jungle. You've been listening to The Tech London Show. 
If you're interested in joining the community or even making an appearance on this show, make sure you join our Slack group over at techlondon.io. Till next time.